Dr. Ohenya Gold, and this is Science on the Street. Today's topic is a serious one that affects all of us, the environment. We know things are getting bad when polar bears start using sunscreen. But here's something that you may not have heard of, environmental justice. It's the idea that everyone, regardless of their race, skin tone, national origin, or income, should have a say in how environmental laws and policies are developed and enforced. Unfortunately, this doesn't always happen and we end up with environmental injustice and racism. Now you might be wondering, how can the environment be racist? I thought only people can be racist. And you'd be right. Policies and decisions created by people led to certain communities being disproportionately exposed to toxic waste and hazardous materials based on their race. This means that the impacts of climate change affect people of color and underserved populations more than their privileged and white counterparts. Did you know that 90% of pollution-related deaths occur in middle to low-income countries and territories? This is due to a number of climate-related causes like pollution, changes in diseases carried by different vectors, increased allergens, changes in clean water supply and food quality, and environmental degradation. All of these conditions lead to an increase in heart and respiratory diseases, malnutrition, vector-borne diseases, and deaths due to severe weather. In the United States, historical policies and actions have led to low-income communities being exposed to toxins and environmental hazards due to the dysregulation of Clean Water and Air Acts. Take the redlining and home loan programs in the 1930s, for example, which prevented black buyers from purchasing homes in more desirable neighborhoods. This led to a decades-long struggle for people of color and minorities to live in places where water, air, and land pollution are more strictly monitored. Additionally, because the U.S. Congress tends to be split pretty evenly, no long-term policies are put into place. Instead, any changes to climate policies rely on executive orders, which swing wildly back and forth depending on the administration. Obama put into place several climate tackling strategies during his term, but Trump then weakened or overturned them using over 150 executive actions. Biden has started undoing this damage, also through executive orders. This process of enacting and overturning climate actions via executive actions is more on again, off again than Ross and Rachel's relationship in Friends. Let's talk briefly about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. It's a prime example of these types of injustices. Due to budget cuts, the city switched its water supply from piped water from Detroit to the Flint River. Unfortunately, the river was already experiencing high levels of chloride, which can react with other substances in the water to create harmful carcinogens. Soon after they made the switch, residents noted that the tap water smelled, looked, and tasted bad. To make things worse, the city neglected to treat the water with anti-corrosives, which caused the pipes to leach lead into the water. This resulted in lead poisoning in the population, which can severely affect mental and physical development even at low levels of ingestion. The only thing more toxic than the water in Flint is a Kanye West tweet. The water was so corrosive that even General Motors had to stop using it in their factories because it was corroding their engines. The city's water has returned to standard levels after switching back to treated water from Detroit, but the effects of this crisis will last a lifetime. These issues aren't just limited to the United States. Across the Western world, white governing populations have repeatedly displaced native peoples and populations of lower incomes to make nature preserves for themselves. Some of these procedures date back to the 1700s in the UK and were then exported to the New World during the creation of national parks like Yellowstone and Yosemite. The indigenous people who had shaped and maintained those grounds for millennia were evicted and their communities were decimated. The effects of climate change and degradation caused by human-driven pollution and over-harvesting of natural resources will impact everyone, but the groups being affected the most are the ones being left out of conversations about conservation. It's time to shift the focus toward not just mitigating climate change, but also reintegrating biodiversity into urban areas and protecting the people who are most affected by the lack of these actions. When it comes to environmental protection, we all need to channel our inner Leslie Nope and treat our planet like it's a new park project. I'm sitting down with Dr. Lacey Satcher, who is an urban environmental sociologist. Hi Lacey, welcome to the show. 
I like to get a chance to talk to you and talk about environmental justice. So you sit in a really interesting intersection of sociology and environmental studies. Can you tell us a little bit about your research? Oh, absolutely. So my research uh, is kind of uh, the nexus of inequality built in natural environment and health. And so I study the ways that the built environment, namely like neighborhoods and cities, is impacted by historically racist processes. Um, and in that, uh, there's this inequality across and within neighborhoods that impacts the health of um, individuals. Um, my research usually examines southern urban cities. Now that I, I'm here in Boston, I'm expanding that to explore urban cities um, in the Northeast and really across the U.S. Um, and more recently, I'm examining all, examining all of these things within the context of the climate crisis. When you say you're, you're examining health and how that sort of intersects with climate, you're not just talking about physical health, you're, you cover things like mental health and like food inequality and things like that as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So things like uh, like place attachment um, in uh, neighborhoods that have less access to environmental resources or neighborhoods that um, have closer proximity to environmental hazards, right? And how those sorts of things and how the stigma of living in uh, environmental justice communities uh, can impact one's health and also the stress of living near you know environmentally hazardous things or not having access to things like uh, parks and grocery stores in your neighborhood how that can have mental health uh, uh, impacts on individuals in neighborhoods these ideas of environmental justice and environmental racism are different but related concepts. Can you explain how they connect? Yeah, absolutely. So environmental justice um, has more to do with um, this idea that we all are on this earth as equals, and yet uh, some individuals um, share a bigger burden of the environmentally um, unsafe or dangerous uh, things that um, that emerge as a result of like human development, right? And so there are certain communities that have, uh, again, are closer to things like waste incinerators and landfills and other like um, polluting uh, manufacturing plants and nuclear plants. And some communities that um, also lack access to the environmental goods, right? So things like uh, blue space, rivers and, and lakes, and also green space, parks and trees and walk trails and even sidewalks right and so that's at the core of environmental justice this idea that those things whether they be good the environmental hazards the environmental burdens and the environmental amenities should be fairly distributed across space and across communities and they're not environmental racism has more to do with the like historical uh institutionally racist processes that place uh, communities in color, and namely uh, black communities in U.S. context, um, near environmentally hazardous, uh, or in environmentally hazardous conditions, right? And so that has to do with how environmental laws and policies are enforced, right? Historically, how they've been enforced, um, and how they continue to be enforced. Um, just the language of environmental laws and policies. Uh, and also, most importantly, I, I think, um, at the institutional level, representation of people of color on the um, boards and organizations that make decisions about where the next nuclear plant will be sited, or where the next landfill or waste incinerator will be sited, or you know which neighborhood will get a new park and which neighborhood won't. When there's not representation at that level, at that level, like on city councils and on um, commissions and all of these entities that give permits. Right. Um, that's also an example of environmental racism. That points to this idea that you know it's not just voting in the national elections that's important. It's voting at every level of of government that helps you know, change these really horrible policies and and redistribute this sort of environmental wealth across different communities. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Um, 
that's a huge part of uh, keeping work towards environmental justice going is that uh, voting, but before even voting is like increasing awareness. Um, I think a lot of folks, uh, just like folks don't know that the neighborhood that they live in is uh, an environmental justice community or like the, 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 the paper mill is like, you know, uh, giving off these really like, like air pollution or that the water that they're drinking isn't like up to standards. Most people don't know that that information isn't necessarily readily available. Um, and in terms of other kind of constraints and uh, things going on in people's everyday life, right? Um, environment isn't necessarily like, or, or like whether or not my neighborhood is getting polluted is not necessarily the uh, main thing folks are thinking about. There are other like socioeconomic concerns and other, you know, other concerns um, for folks in neighborhoods. So increasing awareness of like environmental justice and environmental issues um, as it relates to exposure. And also again, amenities um, is really important so that people can take that knowledge and go to the ballots and uh, vote for policymakers and city council members that also consider those things a priority and are willing to uh, create policy towards making changes. Do you think that the lack of accessible information on these topics is the biggest challenge towards repairing some of these injustices or are there other challenges that also come into play? So I think lack of it, lack of accessible information is definitely a, a huge, a really huge challenge. Um, I think for a lot of us to do like environmental justice scholarship formally, um, you know, a lot of what we just for the because of the nature of academia, a lot of what we publish about what's going on in these communities and how, you know, this is affecting communities gets published in like academic journals and um, everyday folks aren't reading academic journals. Right. Um, and so uh, there's less public, less than I think there should be a public scholarship about, you know, environmental issues and environmental uh, uh, hazards and how to kind of make your voice heard if you feel like, you know, uh, this new plant or this new manufacturing uh, company um, or factory isn't going to be good for your community in terms of, in, you know, environmental issues, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think lack of accessible knowledge is huge. I think also, though, um, lack of kind of uh, action by policymakers who do get the memos, who do, who are emailed, or, or pressured or pressed by environmental justice activists and, you know, scholars um, in the field. Um, they know, like, they have knowledge, right? And so lack of action on the part of policymakers is also, I think, uh, um, one of a, a big barrier as well. Can you provide uh, an example of successful environmental justice initiatives that have occurred? Um, so uh, one that I continue to think about um, is like, I, well, first, I think the, the mobilization, uh, the environmental justice mobilization, they really kind of kicked off what we know now uh, as the environmental justice movement in U.S. context, right? And that was in uh, Warren County, um, North Carolina. Uh, there were plans to uh, place a landfill near a uh, low-income, predominantly black community um, in Warren County um, that uh, were going to be, um, the landfill was going to be filled with PCBs, which is a really um, uh, harmful chemical that's been linked to uh, birth defects and, and cancer and all these things. And this was back in 40s, 50s, or 60s, probably the 50s. Um, and uh, the community came together. Um, and actually, this was the first time that someone kind of voiced, put a name on it um, in the mobilizations, in the protests, um, folks started saying, like, this is an example of environmental racism, right? And so I think um, that, that's kind of a, a, mo a more notable example. In Alabama, in a similar situation, um, uh, there were, uh, there's a factory that was leaking DDT, which is another really dangerous chemical link, um, from pesticides into the water, the groundwater of a community, and folks started getting sick. And like there was a, a huge, uh, uh, like a large, like uh, 
population of residents in and around Triana, Alabama that were like developing cancer. And people were trying to figure out why. And um, after suing the company and getting um, the water tested, um, the residents and the city and state government found out that, yeah, both these past like two or three decades, um, residents have been basically getting poisoned. Um, and the end of that was that uh, residents were paid uh, uh, not enough. There's not enough money to kind of recover, you know, loss of life and, you know, something like cancer. But residents were paid. There was some re- remediation. The uh, the manufacturing plant was cleaned up. Uh, and so to me, that was a that was an s- example of some sort of like success in terms of communities coming together and like pressuring um, companies and pressuring the government to also play a role uh, and uh, hold corporations and uh, folks accountable for essentially poisoning communities. It seems like a lot of these issues come to light when people start getting sick. Um, yeah. And it's really unfortunate. I know most people default to thinking about Flint, Michigan and their water crisis. Um, yeah. But there should be a way to have these issues not happen and if they are happening to not wait for people to get sick before they come to light are there strategies or policies that can mitigate some of these issues from my research we've seen that um uh environmental justice mobilizations are most successful when they're happening to kind of preempt the siting of an industry or preempt something happening um um, so before the landfill gets there before the manufacturing plant gets there um mobilizing the community to push back like other communities that say you know not in my backyard right there's plenty of NIMBY communities where uh corporations will try to uh develop uh or, or or site a plant or a landfill or you know a factory and a lot of communities have a lot of like political power and political pull, and they can immediately kind of, you know, dead that situation, right? And so getting um, other communities just as mobilized, right, to kind of um, yield their political power and say, hey, we're not going to stand for you all sighting this year, and we're going to push back, and we're going to protest, and there'll be civil disobedience, and there'll be litigation, we'll hold it all up in courts for a very long time until you say, until the corporations say, okay, this isn't, you know, this isn't worth the hassle. Let's move on, right? And so uh, having that information, right? So having stakeholders who are informed on those boards, right? When uh, companies and corporations initially approach city or state governments about siting, right? Having those kind of, you know, informants um, and stakeholders there um, to go be able to go back to communities and let them know, hey, this is, co- this is on the horizon. This is coming. We should get moving on kind of doing some uh, mobilization. Now, in terms of things like the Flint water crisis, which I wish I could say was a, a, a successful environmental justice mobilization, right? But it's still kind of an ongoing um, issue and an ongoing problem, as well as the water crisis that is uh, hits home for me because I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, right? Um, that has a lot to do with like really old infrastructure, all right, and lack of kind of oversight. Um, when it comes to the infrastructure of some of these uh, cities in the U.S., right, that are that are super, that are really old, right, and that kind of need funding uh, to kind of completely revamp, revamp the infrastructure, right? And so uh, the new infrastructure bill, hopefully, is a solution to that. When people talk about environmental justice, the focus is on, you know, uh, underrepresented groups, minorities, people of color, and how it really affects those communities more so than other communities. Um, In the long run, and I know we're all familiar with this, environmental issues are going to affect everybody and solving them at these levels, you know, with new infrastructure and with uh, oversight and with regulation, is gonna be good for everybody in the long run. So I don't understand personally why, why it has gotten to this level where people are getting sick pipes are breaking down and everything feels like it's sort of falling apart before yeah. the government gets involved. Yeah. I, yeah, I 
think I think one of the issues here, and I don't know how or why, um, but I feel like things that should be a concern for everyone, right? Like environmental, like pollution, environmental justice issues broadly, right? Environmental hazards, bad things going into the air that everyone has to breathe, right? Or into the water that everyone has to drink, right? Um, and also like climate change, right? It should be like a general, okay, everyone recognizes that we're all kind of screwed if we don't fix this, right? It doesn't happen because I think more recently, in the last decade or so, it's been so uh, politicized, right? And so even if people are concerned about that, you know, manufacturing plant down the street, like, there's this idea that thinking about environmental issues and environmental pollution is like a left-wing thing, and I'm not left-wing, so... That should, that's not my concern, right? That's like a leftist uh, uh, agenda item, right? Or even like climate change, right? Something that will affect everyone. It's affecting um, the global south and, you know, other uh, uh, lower income and uh, marginalized communities now, but like it's going to affect everyone. Like the North End is, is, is slowly but surely flooding right um in here in boston um but again it's also really politicized whereas like if you identify this way politically there's no way you can talk about climate change as a real thing which doesn't make sense because the proof is there i think at this point the 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 proof is there the science is there but even science gets politicized right when it should just be like science like right um (laughs) So I think that's that, that's a big part of it. So helping with making information accessible, voting at every level of government, including local elections that feel sort of inconsequential on like a grand scale, but really, really aren't, really aren't. Um, making sure these policies are enacted and enforced, yeah. keeping all of the benefits of healthy environments, uh, you know, accessible to marginalized communities. If we do all of those things in an ideal world, uh, what, what's your outlook? What's your outlook on public health? If we do all of those things, and also, I, which is a key thing, especially I've noticed, like reframing not only environmental issues, but also climate change as an economic issue and connect it to, like, if we do these green solutions and if we um pay attention to these environmental issues it'll make more money which shouldn't be that shouldn't be the way to get people to change their minds but we live in a capitalist society money rules everything around me um <laughs> not me but <laughs> i'm quoting <laughs> uh but uh so that's a big part and so there have been uh environmental sociologists and sociologists more broadly that have kind of said like hey if we're trying to reframe and get people on board we gotta frame it as a economic issue and not just a social justice like woke issue it has to be it has to be an economic uh uh gain in investing in climate change like mitigation and adaptation um stuff or like environmental issues that has to be some sort of like maybe more jobs or you know some sort of like way to point to hey if you do this it's good for the economy and then more folks will get on board but as as long as we continue to frame it as a justice issue which i don't see the issue with because i feel like empathy is something everyone but i don't know but yeah so i think that also is a key part reframing um for for certain communities kind of reframing it um to get some uh buy-in I think that also points to why it's taken so long, like, you know, decades to get the infrastructure to be fixed because it costs money and the, the, the pro, the benefit to it is kind of invisible in that, you know, public health, it doesn't show outwardly, but in the long run, it costs a lot when it's not, you know, kept up. Um, so this, this idea of reframing is really key, I think. How do you think businesses and industries can be held accountable for their impact on the environment? I think one way is there, like actual like pressure from the public via 
social media via actual like in person like protests at the you know in front of the uh corporate buildings and like shaming you shouldn't have to but like shaming corporations into uh enacting some changes even if they're not real right we're hoping that they're real right but like just that step right is better than uh what was before and so i think um again continue to have public pressure on corporations that are like polluting and doing doing you know not so good things in terms of environment like there's like beaches and landfills full of like blouses right <laughs> so <laughs> we need to <laughs> and jeans right um and so this needs to be then you, you need to provide solutions if you want people to continue to support you know your company and buy your book um so I think that's that's really important. I've seen um, economists talk about talk about uh, certain like uh, tax penalties um, uh, and other like penalties for corporations that don't kind of meet a standard in terms of depending on the industry, right? Uh, like uh, emissions or uh, a carbon footprint and things like that. And I think that's really important. You just have we just have to have buy in at the federal level. Right, because uh, I, that's the only way to make corporations, like to force corporations to be able to do something. Right, you can, public pressure is nice, and a lot of companies kind of succumb or like make changes because of the public pressure. But having it like a part of like a regulatory policy would be even better. How can a, a I will put a regular person get involved with? advocacy oh so um just about every city that i've lived in there have been environmental justice and uh or climate justice organizations that are always looking for volunteers for researchers um for uh folks to go door to door, door, to door or for folks to um show up at community events and give out information um uh, who, who are looking for folks to show up at elementary or like K through 12 schools and give presentations on like Earth Day. Um, and so all of those are ways that we can do that. Like um, there's plenty of organizations here in Boston that are doing really great, really great work in terms of environmental justice uh, and climate justice stuff. Um, and so I think uh, that's the way to start. Just um, um, donating your time because not everyone has money to, to give to, you know, donate to like Greenpeace or, or, you know, one of the, you know, a bigger NGO, right? But, you, you know, if there's even like an hour a week that you can come and help plant trees um, with like, for example, the Speak for the Trees uh, nonprofit organization here um, in Boston, right? That's do it, that, that, that's helping, right? Um, and just also on an individual level, being mindful of, especially in terms of like the climate crisis, right? Being mindful of your own carbon footprint, right? Um, I don't want to make it seem like individuals are driving the climate crisis because they're not. It's the corporation. So I'm not saying that at all. But like small changes, right? They may not have a huge impact on climate change, right? But, you know, a little, sometimes a little by a lot of people goes a long way. I agree with that. It's something I tell my students too. A little, a little, <laughs> a few actions, a few changes make a big difference. And we'll see you next time on Science on the Street. Welcome back to Street and Greet. I'm your host, Costas Winslow, on the streets of the Boston Commons, ready to find out what people's thoughts are on environmental justice. I'm a pediatric nurse, oh. and so I worked in an asthma clinic. Um, and air quality is a huge factor in childhood asthma in adult asthma. I also like measure lead levels like in kids, you know, and that kind of stuff comes from the water and all of that. I'm from southwestern Virginia originally and I've definitely seen like pollution in a watershed sort of affect the like the ecological health of um, fishing, which you hear about it through people that are like, you know, local to these kinds of areas. Since everything's pretty much messed up, like whether it be plastic in the ocean and our fish and our children, whatever it is, there's pretty much everywhere. You can't avoid it at this point. You just gotta do the best you can to like lower the amount you do.